Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Wow, that's a hard act to follow, I tell you. Isn't that wonderful? Um, so I'm here, I became a better photographer once I understood the thought process that a professional photographer goes through. And today I want to share that with you, my thought process that I go through when I'm shooting pictures for National Geographic magazine. Um, and as it turns out that I learned this from somebody, and one of them just happens to be here today, a guy named Brian Smith who's speaking tomorrow, and I kind of bumped into him by coincidence, and he was a photographer at the Orange County Register back in the mid-80s when I was a wet behind the ears lab tech, and I learned so much from him. And so that's kind of, kind of poetic that I would run into him here. Thank you, Brian, wherever you are. If you're, I was just talking to him a minute ago. Um, so um, I started photography when I was 14 years old. I bought a police, I had a paper route, and I, with my money from the paper route, I bought a police and fire scanner. You know, it's one of these little things, these little radios where you had the flashing red lights and you could hear the fire department dispatch to calls, fire calls. So it was one Saturday, one a summer morning, I heard about a car that was hit by a train on Valley Boulevard near where we lived in Southern California. So I said, Mom, let's go. So I'm too young to drive. So we hopped in our Ford Pinto and off we went. And it was a spectacular car wreck. The car stalled on the tracks. The owner jumped out at the last minute. He was OK, but it was a spectacular car wreck. And I dropped my film off at the newspaper. That afternoon, as always, and I got a big stack of newspapers on my front porch. And right there on the cover was my picture. And I delivered that on my bicycle, wrapped in rubber bands, and delivered it, porched every single one of those. I should have highlighted my name underneath the credit for that. But I was hooked, and I just became, and I, I was hooked with photojournalism, and this has just been my passion ever since. So one of my passions is to shoot wildfires. So this is something that I started on my own as a personal project, and I think every photographer, professional or not, needs a personal project that you can go back to. This ended up being the cover of the magazine a few years ago. And it's something that I went through fire school so I could be safe. And I would go for take two weeks of vacation time and head out to Idaho and I have developed all these contacts that would give me access to fires. Because I was trained, I wasn't a liability and most media were never trained to deal with, for, to learn how to be around forest fires. So this is actually, I shot this in Santa Clarita one year. Here I am deep in Montana with this division supervisor and things are going bad. You wouldn't know it from because he's so calm, cool, and collected, but the, we're trying to keep the fire from the left side of the road, and it's coming from the right side. That's the sun, the smoke, the wind has shifted, and it's blowing the embers and the smoke all over into the green side. The smoke is blocking out the sun, and he's evacuating all his people out. So this is the view that I saw to my right with the winds blowing the embers around. And you don't see the embers in the daytime, but all of a sudden, you look back into the green side and you start to see it bright orange in there and now you're in a bad spot. You can't get that fire out, it's gonna to be too dangerous. And then we were the deepest in, so we had to evacuate out and we hopped in his vehicle and we went through walls of smoke and fire and I was shooting pictures the whole way, just like Ron said, just shoot pictures like crazy when stuff like this is happening. So this is actor Sean Penn's trailer. On the, in Malibu on the foundation of a house he lived in with Madonna, and it burned up in 1994 along with their relationship. But one thing that photography and photographing fires has taught me is about lighting. And one of the ways I solve a lot of problems, visual problems, in shooting for our magazine is lighting. And this is shot in the daytime. This is up in the mountains of Southern California and the big black smoke column has blocked out the sun. So that's like subtractive lighting, right? I'm blocking out the sun and now the flames become brighter and they start to become the light source. And that's what I love. I love it when I have a light source in a picture. And it, it, it taught me about how when I do light things, turn off the lights, go put someone in the shade, do something like that, and I'll show you more of that later. This is a house in the very early stages of burning down. This is in a little neighborhood near Running Springs. Everyone's been evacuated. I'm the only person in there. And 
this is the Santa Ana winds that you hear about, where it's 100 degree temperatures, uh, single digit humidities, and it's 40, 50 miles an hour. And these embers have been blown from another home that's been burning down and landing on these dry pine needles on this deck. And that's how these homes burn down. It's a little tiny fire like this. And this is the same angle the next day. Now what do you see out there? What do you see in those trees? There's still leaves in these trees. It's supposed to be a forest fire. What's happening? Well, these houses catch each other on fire and they set off all these embers with this wind that catch other houses on fire. And they're more, the houses are more flammable than the trees. So here it is again, for those in case you want to compare a feature in the photo. And you can see that one tree is just scorched from the heat of that house burning down. So fire at night is wonderful because there's no sun. So this guy's doing a backfire at night. A backfire is where you have, start with an anchor point like a river or a road, and you set fire to all the unburdened vegetation between that anchor point and the advancing fire. And that way you have fire going away from you. That advancing fire through convection and all the heat coming up will suck in that fire. And now you've got fire going away from you, and it's more controlled, and you're, burning, you're widening out that fire break, essentially. So for this, I wanted it lit by the, by the fire, but I'm, I've got a strobe going off. I've got, I, I have my strobe dialed down to minus three on my flash. So it's just kicking in a little bit. And if, you're, and if you can see, there's a little bit of highlights off the buckles, off of his, off of his uh, harness there. And I put a little warming gel on it. It's like a, t a half tungsten warming gel on the strobe so that it kind of matches the, the light from the fire, which is very warm. So I'm, I'm going through this forest fire at night, and this is my thought process that I'm going through, which is very different than the f thought process that this guy is going through. But this is how I'm able to make these pictures. So one of the great things working at National Geographic is that if you have an idea and they kind of halfway believe in it, they will buy into it and fund it. So through my fire experiences, we came up with FireCam. So this is a fire protective housing. One of those ports is for a strobe and another, or for a camera, and another one's for a high HD video camera. So here's a picture from it. This is a fire in the Northwest Territories, a crown fire, and you can't see this any other way but from a remote camera that can survive this fire. And here is a video from that fire. Whoops, that plane. So first of all, this is not speeded up. This is a video of, from one of those video, from a video camera that was in our fire cam. And what you're seeing here is the smoke, the fire's coming from behind us. And that big black smoke column is blocking out the sun. And ahead of it, it's throwing embers. And this is how fire burns. It throws these embers out ahead of itself that preheats the ground. So now the fire's coming from behind us and preheating this green vegetation. And then as the heat goes up, you know, you heard about fires creating their own wind. They get this push of, as that air goes up, cooler air on the ground needs to replace it. And that's what helps keep push the fire along. And you can't see that any other way. This is not speeded up, this is real time. So you can see that if you're in a house and you're saying, I'm not gonna evacuate my house, there's this fire coming. By the time you see this, it's too late. And you can see how it just, just this, is only, this clip is only about a minute and a half, but it, you can see just how drastically it changes the landscape. And this is what fire's been doing for the last 10,000 years in the American West and in, in North America. All right, enough fire. Um, so I'm a bit of a Swiss Army knife at National Geographic. Uh, this is another assignment I had. You might have heard about James Cameron, the filmmaker and build a submarine to go down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. So that was my assignment. For th it was supposed to be three weeks. It ended up being two months. Extended one week at a time on this ship. So this is his sub coming back at night um, with the lights of the, sh of the ship coming to pull it out of the water. Here's Jim inside the submarine. This is a four foot diameter sphere loaded with equipment and heavy and, and electronics that are very hot. 
and he's six foot four, so he gets kind of shoehorned into this thing. And then it sits vertically in the water column, unlike any other submarine you've ever seen, so that it can go down very quickly. And then he motors around the bottom like this, and then he can come up very quickly. That pressure sphere is in the bottom part, the very bottom part of this. The rest of it is full of a special foam that won't compress at depth. He, he goes down with weights, the weights are dropped, and then he comes back up. And there's the big hero shot that uh, I, I did of Jim with the whole classic National Geographic Explorer project. So now I want to show you a little sneak peek at what I, a story I shot that is going to be in next month's edition of National Geographic. This is going to be in the July issue, and it's a story on human performance. So this is Michael Andrew. He's the next Michael Phelps in swimming. And he's just turned 18, and his dad is his coach, he's homeschooled, and he has a two-lane covered swimming pool in his backyard, and he lives in Lawrence, Kansas. So I went to his place to shoot this picture, and I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna do some portraits of him, but what am I gonna do in his pool? How am I gonna, so this is a spread, I should explain this. Um, so what you're seeing there is actually the gutter is where the, the white page on the left matches him, and then it's actually a gate fold, so it folds out, and this is what you would see on the inside. And so I, kind of on a hunch, I thought, you know, what am I gonna do in this pool? It's just fluorescent light in there, it's covered, it's like 20 degrees outside, what am I gonna do? So I, we had, I knew we had these underwater strobes, and I knew that if I could get one of them to fire, then the other one would fire. So I brought them along, and I, ha I wired up one of them so that a cable would come out and a radio remote receiver would, would trip it. And if it tripped that one, it would trip the other one. Michael helped me set them in the water so I didn't have to get wet. And these are a couple, I wanted to share with you a couple other pictures from that um, shoot that didn't make it in the magazine. So I have to worry about the gutter, the dreaded gutter. It's in the middle of a spread, right like this and you don't want to put something really important in that gutter. So as he's doing the butterfly across the water, I've kind of strategically placed the, cropped it so that I've got the gutter right in the middle, and that's his dad cheering him on. And this is all lit for these strobes underwater. I turned off the fluorescent lights that were in there, and you get this much moodier look. And, it, and part of his success is also this kind of spiritual, uh, sayings on the wall and kind of the spiritual life that he and his family live. live. They're a very close family, and that's part of what makes him one hundredth of a second faster than his competitor. Here's another one I liked, but it didn't make it in the magazine. It, I felt like he's kind of swimming in air. <coughs> okay, so then when you turn that page over and you fold out the gatefold, you get this picture of Michael. And I shot this in his kitchen. So in his kitchen, he's got pull-up bars. And I also shot this one there too. I set up a, a background, and then I, I like to use strip lights. You guys know what soft boxes are, right? These, these light, these big kind of boxes that diffuse the light, and you put a strobe in there, and it makes it soft. And this is a video that his mom shot. So. I'm gonna kind of show it to you because I didn't shoot any kind of behind the scenes pictures and this gives you a feel for what that shoot was like. I've got a gray background paper set up. I've got some booms with these strip lights that are kind of rimming his body, accentuating his muscles. So he's got this pull up bar in his kitchen. So I, and one of the things they wanted were a lot of kind of beautiful body pictures of these athletes for this story. I mean, he's just got, he's got ropes for veins. And I had to do a little selfie with him. And then I had lunch just out in his kitchen with the, the background paper in the background, the lights and everything. So that's, what, that's the best part of my, my job. It's not so much making the pictures for the magazine, it's the people I get to meet along the way. 
that's the best part of what I do. Everything from get people like Michael Andrew and his family and these wildland firefighters. So we went out to his pool, and that's where I shot those other pictures, and I shot this of him on his starting block. So this looks pretty straightforward until you see the setup. So we're at the edge of his pool. He has kept the pool cover on. We pulled the background down and tore it. The light you see here is on a boom extended over the water. And anytime you have electricity and strobes around a pool, you're in a kind of a dangerous situation. I don't want to be the guy that electrocutes Michael Andrew, right? He's going to be the big thing in 2020. And then on the, I've got another strip light with his mom, and, she, and it was too close if it was just freestanding. It was in the shot. So she pulled it back and just held it there. So many times when I'm setting up these shots, I'm working at the edge of my, my platform or lighting or anything like that. Okay, so this is Usain, this is another spread, Usain Bolt's shoe when he became the world's fastest man. But what I want to talk about is this other picture on the right. Um, this is this $500 swimsuit that Olympians use. They have a different style suit for each event. Breaststroke is different than freestyle. And you can wear it about three times and that's it. And so we were trying to figure out how we were going to shoot this. We were going to like suspend it from a rod and then have water dripping off of it. But the problem is when this is just sitting there, it curls up and it, does, it just looks like a wash rag. So we thought, we'll just try and see what happens if we set it in a tray of water. So what you're seeing here is a, a clear tray of water. I think you can kind of see that. This is uncropped. And I put some black felt in the bottom of it and then filled it full of water and the bathing suit is floating in it. And what you see reflected in the water is a big soft box we have in our studio in Washington, D.C. It's about four feet by eight feet. And the strobe is in there reflecting, and that's what you see. There is a tear in the inner diffusion material up there on the right, and it's like, oh, that looks horrible. What am I gonna do? Well, what if I just shake the water, and now the tear goes away? And maybe it actually helps. There's a bit of a highlight there. And then I also set my camera onto tungsten white balance, because blue says more about water than gray does. And then I shook it and shook it and shook it and shot a whole bunch of pictures and they ended up finding one they liked. So continuing with this human performance story, this is C.J. Cummings. He can lift 450 pounds above his head. And he broke that record when he was 14. He's now 17. And it's the way his body is built that he has optimized for doing this kind of stuff. So I went down to this dingy gym in North Carolina, and I have it backlit with two spotlights. So if I'm him, I've got a light up there, kind of like that one, a light up here, kind of like this one, they're strobes, and then I've got one overhead. So I shoot this, this is the spread, this is what ends up in the magazine. But the, the key thing here is that I didn't stop there. I thought, okay, this is good, but I'm gonna try a different angle. And I got this, and I like this better. This is not in the magazine. But what I did was turned off that light that was on the side, the light that was over there by where it says hook grip. I just turned it off. So I'm only using two lights, and now it's just more dramatic. There's this nice shadow that you can see against the wall of him. There's a good spot for the gutter. They didn't like it. But these are some test shots. What I'm going to show you now are test shots that I did leading up to that. So the trick was, as he does this clean and jerk move, at some point, he covers the light, and these are just some test shots that I did to see exactly when that is so that I could position myself and then shoot that horizontal shot right when he was at the right, right, when he was at the right spot. Um, okay, so now I want to show you a, a, a way to make... One of the things I do a lot at National Geographic is making something out of nothing. And this is a, just a little bit of a buildup of a lighting, ambient lighting, strobe lighting demo that I did. So this is Becky Hale, another fantastic photographer we have at National Geographic, who works in the studio with me sometimes. And this is our back alley. It's a very mundane scene, right? So 
I'm going to just bear with me here. So here's a picture of Becky. And all I did was put her in the shade and expose for the background. OK, so she's basically a silhouette. And what I have in bold is what I have done. What I've, on the right side, you're going to see what I've done. And in bold will be what the change is from the previous picture. So then I put my flash on my camera, and I got this. This is about what you would get, isn't it, if you went and did something like this, right? We filled in the shadows, but it's very harsh and not very interesting. So then I took my flash off my camera, and I set it to the side. So what I'm, I'm using a speed light just like this one, one that you're just very familiar with. And I have it on a radio remote. Um, and then I also put it in a little soft box to soften the light. Eh, not so bad. It's getting better. It's getting better. Then I took a tungsten gel, a full tungsten gel that converts my daylight strobe to tungsten and warms it up. So tungsten are like these warm lights we have around here. And it's, it, so, okay, I'm warming her up. It's looking pleasing. It's soft light. It's, it's not the same direction as the camera. And then I changed my white balance of my camera to tungsten. You see these kind of like stupid camera tricks that I'm doing here? These kind of camera gymnastics? So now the background is turning blue because I'm using tungsten white balance, but the light falling on Becky is neutral because I'm, my white balance is balanced for that strobe that I've got the tungsten gel on. OK, that's not bad. Now, what if I pick a faster shutter speed, where it, my shutter speed is two stops underexposed for the background? So now the background gets darker and a bit more dramatic, less distracting. So there's everything. So now I'm, my background, I'm underexposing my background by two stops. I'm using my flash off the camera. I've got a soft box. I've got a tungsten gel. And I'm a, and I'm a tungsten white balance. So those, those two bottom ones are neutralizing each other out. Well, I want to warm it up a little bit more. So I've added a half tungsten gel on top of that. So now it's warming her up a little bit more than before. So, that's where we are now. Then I thought, well, let's just take the softbox off and see what that looks like. So that now, same as before, but now it's a little bit, it's just this, just the strobe. Probably just flashing that area off camera. So then the next thing I thought was, you know, there's a little zoom built into these where you can zoom the strobe that's supposed to coincide if you've got a zoom lens. So I zoom the strobe to maybe 135 or 200, I'm not quite sure. And then I shot that. So now there's this little halo of light coming in. It's more directed. So here's where we started. And here's what we ended up with. We might have, you might say we started with that. And it's not a lot of equipment, it's just, but it's just a lot of know-how. And in this digital world, you can experiment with these things and work them and work them and work them until you get something that you like. So this is just a very common subject matter in a very common place where I've used a little bit of know-how to make kind of a dramatic picture, portrait situation. So I take this out into the field with fires. So I'm out there in Northern California near Hayfork uh, a couple years ago, and I'm bringing with me a softbox and that's got a couple of these in it, battery operated, light stand. And this is day 21 for this crew from Salt Lake City. 21 days in a row working on fire. Haven't had a shower since they left home. And this is how I did it. So I bring with me my little box, and I've got my soft box. I've got one of these in there. There might be two in there. And I set up. And first, I pick a background. I'm looking for something that will look good. So these are some test shots I did. I did these test shots the night before I was going to do those other shots. Um, we had kind of, a, kind of a break for dinner, and it was a, a good time to do it. So I purposely turn his face so that it's going to be in the shade. Because I want to have, my, I want to have some shadow, and that shows shape. So 
then my strobe goes off and lights them up. I added a little warming gel here, but I didn't when I shot those portraits later because they were kind of warm enough and dirty enough and I thought that was, that was enough. Okay, so another th thing I do in my thought process is anticipation. I'm always trying to think, am I in the right place for the next three seconds, three minutes, or three days? So here's an example. I was in Galapagos on a Limblad trip, and we were waiting for the bus. And this is like this Galapagos flycatcher, which lives nowhere else in the world, and it just so happened to be on a branch about six feet away from me, bouncing around on this branch. And we're just all kind of talking, and we're waiting for the bus. And when we're talking and waiting for the bus, I can't stop thinking about taking pictures, because that's just what I do. And I start looking and looking and looking, and I've noticed this bird. So I, as we're talking, I change my ISO up so I can get a very fast shutter speed. So that's why I included this in here, 30, 32 hundredth of a second. And, but that wasn't the first picture I shot. I didn't even know I had this until I looked at it later. You know how Ron said, if you saw it, you missed it? Yeah, well, I didn't see this, so I didn't know I got it. So I get back on the ship, and I'm looking at my pictures, and I shot this one first, and I shot this one first, and I shot that one, and then I shot this one, and he was all bouncing around. I thought, if I just use a high shutter speed, I'll be able to capture maybe some interesting wing positions or interesting, and I ended up getting that one. Um, so guess where I shot this picture? Anyone guess? So this is in Galapagos. Actually, this is in the Northern Hemisphere. There are penguins in Galapagos at the very tip of the Northern Hemisphere. And the only reason I have this shot this picture is because I was watching this little penguin. There's only a few of them. And he would dive down, come up, and then swim around on the surface and eat his fish. And then this is what you'd see. All these snorkelers around, following him around, taking pictures, and I got a lot of that, I got a lot of that. And then he would dive back down again, and then all of the interest in him would be gone. Nobody cared. So they all went off on other things. But I sat there and waited. And I changed the settings, although this is just kind of a point and shoot underwater camera. I made sure I had a high ISO because when he was coming up, and he kept coming up from the same place, and he would come up from the murky depths. So I went back and I just sat there and waited and waited and waited and waited. And then I saw this and I just started taking pictures. That's the frame before. And that's the frame after. And this is the frame cropped. And the only reason I got that picture is not because I went on Galapagos and went snorkeling. It's that I went in Galapagos, went snorkeling with and found a penguin and thought about it. It's that thought process. You know, if, if, if somebody next to me snorkeling with their camera like this and looks at it, goes, oh, I just missed that. I said, I, I don't tell them this, but it's like, you didn't just miss it. You weren't even close. You weren't even close to being there. It's like I had pre-focused. I was like ready for this. And that's what's so important. It's that anticipation. It's, it, and once you start thinking about that and get that in your thought process of life, um, you know, it, it really makes a difference. So let's see here. I've got, so here's another thing in Galapagos. Um, these flamingos were at this lagoon. And the thing is, once people show up, they start getting a little freaky. So I do a test shot. I kind of crept up over the little rise. I did, we did a test shot. So that's the way I work. I do a test shot, make sure everything is right. And then I'd never look at the back of my camera if, as long as the light doesn't change. And I just keep shooting. And then they started to take off because we were there. So I am ready. I got my motor drive going. And here he comes. That's kind of fun, kind of gangly. And then I got that one. And it's like, oh, great. And that was all there because of those steps that I took to think ahead about it. So near my house are these eagles show up at the end of December near Maryland and the Susquehanna River. And they happen to run the power generation plant in the early morning and there's fish that get, go through it and they float near the surface. And there's all these eagles that show up to get easy pickings. So I get there with my lens and, and this is like shooting birds full on. I've got an 800 millimeter lens, I've got a camera that shoots 12 frames a second and the light is just perfect. They fly right into the light on a clear day. This is one of them. 
there's, there's my whole get up. It's just really cold. You're just sitting there freezing. And so here's the whole sequence. And I am, and me, you might get him, get a bird diving for fish about once every three hours. So you sit there and wait a long time. And he comes down, he comes down, he comes down, he comes down, grabs the fish, and then he pulls. And what I think is kind of fun is then he looks back. He kind of like sticks his head down below. It's like, did I get it? Did I get it? Yeah, I got it. Fish on board. And then he takes off with it. And then he flies around. Another bird came around and got a fish. And then they just perch up in the tree right above me and start eating it. So some more fire stuff. So this, I fire, this is near Santa Rosa, fires last year. And it, it's, it, it, this is the lighting situation is horrible. The sun's going down through, and, and, and there are these light rays of smoke that are kind of interesting, but everybody's a silhouette. So I put on my flash and I pick a slow shutter speed so I can kind of capture some of that action and that motion that you see. So I'm kind of fill flashing with a little bit of slower shutter speed. And, and that, really seem to help. The problem is I always have to wait for them to turn around. And it's always a dance. It's always a dance. So this is something that actually was not processed much. And I'm always looking for these light ray pictures. So I'm here I am just laying down in the ashes as a firefighter is coming by, mopping up, um, putting line in. And, and then and the wind is blowing left and right. So you just got to sit there and wait it out. I waited about 10 minutes and had a whole bunch of pictures that weren't any good. And finally, I got this one. So I'm always looking for light. This is a night crew going in. And I'm shooting this. And I'm at 6400 ISO, wide open. And these headlamps just show this, look, make this hotshot crew look like they're, they're coal miners. While I was up at that fire, I ended up walking through a lot of burned up illegal marijuana plantations. And there, <laughs> there was a lot of firefighters that were kind of wondering if we were seeing things. And then one night I happened upon this. And does that look, does that look like a fire, a dragon to anybody? Are you, or was I hallucinating? I wasn't, I'm not quite sure. When I'm doing these kind of fires at night, it's beautiful. It is just stunning. You ca I'm able to capture these um, you know, big scenes if I can back up far enough and, and get the crews lighting stuff. I'm shooting at high ISOs and I'm exposing for the shadows. So I'm not exposing for the flames. I like the flames to be white hot. I don't need to see the details in the flames, but I want to see what the flames are illuminating. It doesn't look like this to your naked eye when you're there. It's actually much darker. But I'm in a sense, overexposing from what my meter is telling me so that I can capture what the camera is, what, what's going on in the shady side of things. If I was going to use the exposure that my camera said, you wouldn't even see his face here. He'd be a silhouette. Okay, so in the current issue of the magazine, there's a story about the lost colony of Roanoke that I photographed. So this is an archaeology story, uh, something I've been working on several years. Um, you might the, the short story is in 1585, a bunch of um, colonists came over from England and le ended up in Roanoke, down by the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and they were having a hard go. At, 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 they ran out of stores. They, were, they landed in a place where there was an Indian war going on. And after about three months, they sent their main guy back to England to get more supplies. So John White goes back to England. He can't come back because of the Spanish Armada. He can't come back for three years. He comes, finally comes back, and everybody's gone. Nobody knows what happened to him. Were they killed by the Indians? Did they just die on their own? Did they intermix with the Native Americans? Or did they go up to Jamestown, where a colony was starting? So this is a reproduction of that ship. And shot this from a helicopter when that super moon was happening. This was a rainy day. It rained all day. We weren't even going to fly. But And the ship, once a year, makes an overnight trip to Bath. And then it turns around and comes back two days later. So I had one chance to get a picture of it sailing, because otherwise it's tied up at a dock at kind of a historical park. So we wanted to get something that showed it sailing. So it just rained and rained. 
we got, I got in the helicopter anyway. We, could, we calculated, because the helicopter couldn't fly at night, we only had about 10 minutes on where the, when we met the helicopter, because the helicopter was so far away, where we could fo I could photograph the helicopter. And it turns out the skies parted, and I got this gorgeous sunset of the, of the ship. And it kind of gives me this feel of kind of going off into a new world. And we would have never got this picture if we were sitting back in Manio at the airport saying, oh, it's going to rain, it's, it's raining, we're not going to get a picture. You got to try. And sometimes you got to make something out of nothing. So this is a hole in the ground, hole in the sand. So to light this up, and this is the lead picture for this story in, in the plastic issue of the magazine, which is this month. I've got a tall light stand on the left, a super tall light stand, and I've got a boom, and I've got one of these strobes with a blue strobe on it, shining straight down. And then in the background ahead of me, I've got one of these strobes on a light stand shining towards me. And then I've got another one off to the right, kind of with a spot kind of hitting the hitting those trunks of the tree. And we needed to do something because this was a story that was really hard visually. This is what that normally looks like. This is just a picture of the Indian Midden. So what they were doing was looking for artifacts in this, this trash layer from the 1600s, early 1600s. A lot of dig pictures. But what I wanted to show you is how I made all these artifacts, this was the largest artifact we found. Most of them were the size of my thumbnail. And the trick there is to light that, this is too big. The source is too big. I needed a small source. And so what I came up with was this. This is a fiber optic. Inside here is a fiber optic. I've shrouded it in this kind of articulated plastic material just so that it will stay in a, in a position. And this is my light source. It's about as the thick of a pencil eraser. And what I can do is, it's just a little bit of light, but it's very concentrated and I can move it very close. And here's a picture I shot of that setup. It's just putting this little tiny pool of light. And sometimes I would take black wrap and wrap it around there. And there's more than enough power that comes out of this little guy. And here's a looser shot of the setup. So let me just walk you through this. You see where the camera lens is. The camera I'm using to take this picture was attached to that camera lens. So there's, it's a 180 millimeter, 200 millimeter macro lens. I've got a little bit of a shader on there. That big piece of formica that's attached to that, that's, taking, that's blocking out the sun. So I'm making my own shade so that doesn't contaminate my image. So I'm making it dark. And then I've got one strobe, as you can tell, attached to this guy that is putting this little bit of concentrated light just where I need it. And then I've got another strobe, just like it, but with this little socks. That's like a little soft box. So everything is proportional. I've made a studio, a miniature studio, proportional to the size of the artifact. There's another picture that kind of shows what's going on here. So this is an important artifact. This is a glass arrowhead that was repurposed out of uh, a compass piece of uh, the, the, the glass that was on a compass from back then. So this is their version, the pre-colonial version of Gorilla Glass. We did an XRF scan of it. And you know, Gorilla Glass is this, this glass that's really strong and thin on our phone. And back then, there wasn't a lot of that. And, they, it, and when they were able to make that, they used it to go on scientific instruments like this compass. So this is the size of my little fingernail. It's really small. So I'm using this light, and I'm, I've got a palmetto palm behind it. I've got another strobe on. And I'm in there with a macro lens, and I'm just kind of moving this around and trying different positions really to get this to pop. What I, what I won't go into is when I drop this into the leaves. And I spent two hours doing my own archaeological dig while everyone was at lunch, sifting through everything to find it again. And so this is a rapier, you know, a sword rapier. This was also found there, and that's a pretty significant artifact. So what I was using, since I had access to 
the artifacts at the site, I was using things in nature around that site to photograph these artifacts. So this was like a last minute thing. This was a mad scramble. At the last minute, someone said, hey, we found this rusty piece of metal. And said, let's, let's take this to the hospital and see if they'll, cat, if they'll scan it for us. So it's like, okay, and we all hop in the thing and I'm like, what gear should I bring? So I'm bringing one of these little strobes here and I have a light stand and I lay it down underneath and that's what's lighting up underneath the table. It's not noticeable, otherwise that would be black there and not nearly as interesting. It's just a veil, and then I, so they're scanning it, and then this is what it was on the screen. It was a ship's nail that was all rusted. So, here's something you might have seen. This is Homo naledi. This is a hominid that was found a few years ago in a cave in South Africa that's two million years old. And this is a fleshed out version of that. They, a guy named John Gurchy, he is brilliant. He took the skull, he adds musculature and tendons to, it, to, a, to a, a cast of the skull, and then he fleshes it out. He adds each hair one at a time. And he paints it, he even makes the eyeballs. It's a, like a five month process. It's amazing. And this ended up being the cover of the magazine. And it was one of those things where whatever cover they were using didn't turn, work out. I don't even know about it. They say, Mark, can you go tomorrow? It's up to Syracuse and, or, um, yeah, Syracuse and shoot this and, and we need you to then send it right back because it's got to be to the printers by that afternoon. But it's going to snow nine inches. That's okay. Just go ahead and do it. So I go up there and shot it. This is, I also brought a turntable with me. So you can see really how wonderful John Gurchie's work is. I put it on a turntable and every five degrees I shot a picture. It looks like a computer animation. But this is all real. He does a wonderful, wonderful job. And this is a picture John shot. This is how these pictures are taken. Not in an elaborate studio, in his living room, where I've moved everything out of the way. My son is off school because it's a snow day, because we got nine inches of snow that day. And he's working the computer. I've got my camera set up there. And then to get that shading, I've got a piece of black foil and I have cut a slit in it and I couldn't ever get it propped up exactly how I wanted it so I Logan just kept taking pictures and I just kept moving it around until it looked good and then we would fire them back and they'd say we want it more dramatic or we want it less dramatic and then they'd send it back to me mocked up as a cover and then we'd do some more and then send it back to them and I just kept working that way here's another shot So I just wanted to show you this as a kind of my final kind of picture of a uh, sequence of things. This is Spinosaurus. This is um, a bigger and badder T-Rex. Spinosaurus knocked T-Rex out of the biggest, baddest dinosaur category. So we had a 53-foot life-size model of Spinosaurus built in Italy. And it was shipped to a parking lot of a country club in Chicago and we wanted to show what it would look like if it was alive today. So we could see street lights in the picture. So of course, we do this at night so that we can control the lighting. This is not my story, it's another photographer's story, and technically he's the photographer of this. I was brought in to just help light it because I can do some of these big production numbers. Ended up being a cover a few years ago. And this is what this looked like. We have a cherry picker. We've got a couple big strobes, pro photo strobes on top. And we've got some other strobes on the side. We've got lots of help. We're using smoke machines and all that kind of stuff. And we had to purposely pick a parking lot where we wouldn't create a scene. Because when you're driving along and you see this giant dinosaur, you're like, what am I seeing here? And it's not an amusement park. So, we, we, we put a lot of care into this, and it was really cold and windy, and we spent for three nights shooting these pictures. And here is one that ended up running in the magazine. It turned out that this was really cool, making it the spectacle of the picture and incorporating the whole scene, made it look kind of like a Hollywood star. So this one ended up running in the magazine, and you just never know what pictures you're gonna use. So you just shoot a lot and do a, try a lot of different scenes and see what happens. So that's all I got. All right, well thank you very much.